Hello! Welcome to our Embedded UI Live series. Today we're talking about Embedded UI Glue Logic. My name is Tomo Fletcher, Vice President of Crank Software, and I'm here today to talk to you about another entry in our series of how to build your embedded user interfaces and connect them to your systems and you know, kind of all the pieces that are involved with that. Um, this is being a live running series. This is session number seven. Um, if you're new to the series, I suggest that you subscribe to the series. That way you can get notifications and updates, especially as we're going into the summer. We're going to take a little bit of a break, but you don't want to miss out in the fall when we resume our sessions. Um, and also there's a backlog of topics, um, great things to learn about, fonts, images, how to configure your MCU and MPUs, um, a lot of really interesting things. But today we're talking about UI Glue Logic. So let's get started. What is UI Glue Logic? So the first thing I'd like to do is kind of put it into context. Um, a lot of times you'll talk about your user interface element here, your UI being disconnected and separated from your system logic, right? And oftentimes we're going to put this into context of a design pattern. Uh, often you'll hear about model view controller, model view presenter, uh, model view view model. Um, and these are all different paradigms for keeping the system logic and the user interface logic separate from one another. And, you know, there's generally a communication pattern that's followed to move data back and forth between the system. And we'll call this actually, just to be consistent with terminology, we'll call this the model, right? The system model and the UI model in the presentation. So MVC, MVP, MVVM, these are all different ways in which you can achieve this separation. But ultimately, they're all uh, sort of concerned with keeping the system model intact and allowing the UI to change its presentation, to change the way it reflects those data values uh, to your system. And you know, this is important for embedded systems because we really like to keep that separation um, you know, kind of nice and clean because we're already working in constrained uh, environments. So we want to have the freedom to optimize individual areas um, as we see fit. So let's talk about what this means, uh, you know, maybe in a little bit more tangible sense. So let's imagine we're talking about a thermostat. Coffee machines and thermostats are always our examples here at Crank. Um, so if I have a system model, I might have temperature as part of the data that I'm storing in my model, right? It might be the current temperature, um, it might be the set point temperature, um, but this is a data value, right? It's not represented in a particular fashion, it may have an associated sets of units with it, so in our case maybe degrees Celsius, but we're not really looking at the data in terms of how it's visually presented, we're just hanging on to the data itself. As we communicate from the model to the user interface, we're going to now start interpreting that in the UI. And maybe what I want to do is I'd like to show that value, for example, you know, put the actual temperature as a label in my user interface. Um, maybe I'm going to show it as degrees Celsius, but maybe, you know, based on user preferences or formatting, I might show it as degrees Fahrenheit, right? So I might have to have some sort of conversion logic. Um, alternatively, right, we might take a more visual approach, right? We might decide that really what we would like is the temperature to be shown in some sort of a, a bar piece with an indicator, and maybe what we want to do is want to color that a little bit, you know, add a little bit of notion of, you know, I'm in a cool zone here, and maybe what I'm doing is I'm in a hot zone up here, and so, you know, we'll have some visual aspects to that. And maybe what we're doing is we're even coloring this bar as we're moving it around. Or, you know, some other combination, right? Just to kind of give us a few different flavors. There's lots and lots of different ways to represent this, maybe what we do is we have a gauge, right? And my gauge, very sophisticated gauge here, um, might have a, this is a uh, cool, warm, hot. And you know, maybe they've got some sort of indicators in here in terms of gradients, or maybe we're changing the arrows as well, right? Lots and lots of different visual representations. What's important here though, is that the temperature's not changing. Right? The value, the model data is not changing. So the stable data tends to be in the model. 
right? It doesn't seem to change very, very often. Uh, so this is important, why? Well, because when we're talking about what it takes to actually show you these various visual presentations, we're talking about transforming this stable value into something that could be changing relatively, rel uh, relatively quickly in terms of opinion, right? Someone looks at the UI and says, no, I think we make, need to make an adjustment. We need to, uh, you know, kind of make some changes. So this tends to be very, uh, we'll call it maybe a little volatile. Volatile's kind of got a bit of negative connotation. Maybe we'll call it agile, right? We want to be able to move quickly through different UI presentations, different UI formulations, representations, um, and we're not changing the model data. And so what's really required in the separation is some sense of glue logic, right? And the glue logic tends to live on the UI side. And if you're thinking about the MVVM, the model view, view model uh, design paradigm, this glue logic would be considered the view model, right? And so what's happening in the glue logic here is we're taking the stable system model data and we're transforming it into whatever it is that the UI needs. If it's formatting a label, if it's changing the units, if it's creating a gradient of color uh, to represent the value, or you know, perhaps we're managing the angular rotation here. Lots and lots of different ways to represent that data. Um, and we want to have lots of freedom. We want to be able to move quickly. So this is why we're talking about Glue Logic today. The importance of you know, what you choose here in terms of the technology, the type of technology you use will dramatically affect your ability to be agile, to be responsive, to change, to alternative presentations for how you're going to incorporate the data from a stable system model. So what I want to do now is I'm going to talk about a couple of different approaches on this glue logic. You can implement it in a lot of different ways. There's no real fixed story around what the glue logic needs to look like. Um, typically, it's transforming data from one representation to another. And we're not talking today about the transport of how I move data back and forth between the system model and the user interface. That's a whole other topic. Uh, it's a great topic, but we're going to use the sort of a generic term of events and data payloads, assuming that there's some sort of decoupled relationship here between the system model and the UI. So one of the first ways that we get into the glue logic is considering compiled glue logic. Um, what does this mean? This means typically using a compiled language like C or C++ um, to implement whether it's callbacks or whether it's data transforms to modify the glue logic that would come or modify the data that would come from the system model and apply it into the user interface. Now, this is nice from an efficiency point of view, and typically your language of implementation here when you're talking about compiled glue logic uh, is aligned with the implementation for your system logic and also, you know, perhaps your implementation for your UI. Um, if your UI is using a compiled library of functionality, then maybe, you know, this is a great fit. There are some challenges though. If we think about, you know, sort of pros and cons, the pro is that you get native execution speed. So it could be very, very fast and it could be a great fit for your system overall. One of the cons, however, is that the type of people that you need to implement this glue logic are going to be programmers. You're going to need to have a programming expertise, familiarity with a tool set, uh, a tool chain, compilers, um, potentially deployment concerns um, to be able to implement this. And that's a challenge because we want this UI to be volatile. We want it to be agile. We want it to be fast moving. Right? We want to be able to give it to users, respond to change, and spin that around quickly. So that is a bit of a, a problem because we can't iterate those changes very, very quickly when we talk about compiled glue logic. And this is a generalization for sure, um, but part of the reason you can't iterate very quickly is because you're going to be in a different domain. Um, you may want to be working in a desktop environment for your prototyping, uh, for your user evaluation, where you need to be able to spin changes around very quickly. And when I have a compiled language in a desktop environment, that means that I need to have my desktop compilers. But if I'm deploying to an embedded target, that means I also have a separate compiler and tool chain for that glue logic 
down for those platforms. So this ends up being a bit of a build and maintenance uh, effort that now has to be incorporated into the project. So for this reason, you know, the compiled glue logic, while it does offer us certain performance efficiencies, can overall slow the project down just because of the nature of, um, of, of what you're working with um, and who's going to be doing that work. So that kind of takes me into the second area. What is an alternative? If I don't have compiled glue logic, right? If I'm not using a compiled language to do this, what can I use? Well, I could use a similar situation or a similar technology, a little bit different, um, and ease those portability concerns, ease the uh, cost concerns in terms of how much effort is required for me to maintain my glue logic across a variety of environments. And for this, I could use a scripted solution. Uh, something like Lua, which is what Storyboard uses, or JavaScript or Python, um, something that's a little bit higher level than your compiled language. Um, you are still going to need to have a little bit of programming expertise, but these languages are typically designed to have a lower barrier to entry. Um, they're a little bit more morphable, a little bit easier to work with. Um, and so that's a bit of a, you know, it's still a programmer's effort, but it's a little bit more thinking of the logic rather than thinking about the language and the programming techniques. Um, what's nice here is that a lot of these languages um, will have an efficient execution. Um, they will be able to offer you comparable execution times for the scope of work that we're talking about. One of the nice things about Blue Logic is that we're only working with small bits of code. This is the connective work. As data comes in, I need to transform it, right? If I want to change a temperature value into a rotational angle, um, then that's just a little bit of work. So I don't actually need long run efficiency that the compiled code would give me. A lot of what I can get with a language interpreter is going to be enough, right? It's going to be fast enough. It's going to be um, you know, good enough. And what it gives me is the cross platform ability. Now I can actually do work on a desktop, on my embedded target, and I can work very, very quickly moving changes around because I don't have to go through that long compile cycle. I can implement change very, very quickly in my UI, which allows me to be responsive to users. So again, why are we talking about Blue Logic? We're talking because it's a, uh, a connective piece that allows you to build better embedded user interfaces. Um, there are some challenges, however, uh, depending on you know, sort of your situation, uh, you may be in an environment where simply the overhead of implementing the scripting logic uh, is too high, right? Uh, these scripting engines typically require some sort of additional overhead. In the case of Lua, you know, we can have 80 to 100K of you know, just the Lua language interpreter that's required for us to be able to support the language. Um, and that could be too much. That could be over the resource uh, capacity of your embedded target. So you know, a bit of a potential drawback there. So if I look at you know, sort of the third scenario for implementing the glue logic, it's what I'm calling the high level glue logic. Um, this is something that is really a technology or a domain specific solution. It tends to be associated very much with a particular technology um, and it assists and works hand in hand with that particular technology to lift up that glue logic uh, concept and, and move it from being a particular programming language or implementation to being a more abstract data concept, right? And if we think about what happens with our thermostat as temperature values change and we want to flow them in, we want to be able to process that data almost as a stream, right? We like to associate this temperature value with a UI output and form that association. And so some tools allow us to do those direct data mappings and bindings uh, so that you're not really programming. There's certainly programming going on behind the scenes, and, um, but that you're working at a higher level. You're working at a level that's a little bit more uh, data oriented and a little bit more contextual to the problem that you're solving. Uh, so two different you know, sort of approaches here, data bindings and mappings, uh, where you could have a set of transforms that make an association between when this value is received, I'd like to process it in this way, um, and I'd like to make an assignment to this output value in terms of the UI. Um, or you might also see something a little bit more like uh, flow-based programming. 
right, where you are processing data kind of as a stream and you're running it through a series of filters and transforms and, you know, conditions and branches and then pumping that into an output. Now, if we consider this in the context of, you know, scripted and compiled languages, these are techniques that kind of sit on top of those two other approaches uh, in terms of how they can be implemented. Uh, and they are very technology specific. So while you may not need programmers any longer to implement your, uh, your glue logic, what you are going to need is you're going to need people who are versed in these specific technologies. Um, and that could be part of building up the expertise with a particular technology. Uh, and so this is both a pro and a con, right? You can become very, very powerful uh, with these domain-specific languages and make a significant investment if that's part of your, your long-term story. The other area is a lot of these domain-specific languages and, and specific techniques are designed to allow you to iterate and move rapidly. So once you've gone over the language curve or the technology curve of learning, uh, you're able to very, very quickly assemble solutions um, and, and iterate content for your, your users. Um, different technologies have different costs, so it's kind of hard to say across the board whether or not it's going to be a low or a high platform maintenance uh, cost, but generally these are technologies that are bound in with specific solutions, and so you can look at your vendor, your te UI technology vendor, to assist you with uh, some of that maintenance and, and porting costs. Now, just to give you an idea here of what something like that might look like, um, I have a design here. We have a, a sample within Storyboard. It's a cluster. Um, and this is what a flow-based programming uh, approach might look like for how you do the data processing. Here you can see that it's very, very different from uh, going in and doing programming language you know, into a text editor. It's really you know, sort of mapping out the relationship of incoming data to outcoming results, and in this case, we're using Node-RED uh, as a uh, as an interpreter system, and then flowing events into the system using our Storyboard IO. So this was a sample that we worked with one of our customers on, um, as a built a, built up a bit of a prototype. Interesting to see, interesting approach. Certainly a little bit different. So a bit of a shorter session today, but I just wanted to kind of highlight where we are you know, with this uh, type of technique. We're looking at transforming data from your model into your UI, and there's lots of different ways and different approaches that you can do to accomplish that. Which one you end up choosing um, will really depend on the environment that you're operating in. Uh, in some cases, you're going to want to have compiled glue logic because your resource costs are too low. But if you use a compiled solution, your compiled solutions are typically going to require a little bit more overhead and maintenance from your infrastructure or in terms of your product build and they're going to require a little bit more of a long uh, a little bit longer of a cycle for you to implement change inside the UI. You're going to have programmers deeply integrated onto the team so that they can continue to be responsive. Using Glue logic that involves a scripting language like Lua, like JavaScript, um, will allow you to iterate those changes much more quickly. It will also lower your maintenance and uh, overhead costs in terms of how much cross-platform work you're going to have to do within your build your product uh, infrastructure. On the other hand, what you're going to you know, sort of require is a little bit more resource overhead on your embedded target. Uh, but the flexibility that they bring in terms of your ability to change the UI and, and motivate um, or react to uh, changes um, after you talk to users, present it, um, is going to be very, very high. You're going to be able to cycle those changes really quick and be very, very responsive. And everybody knows that you know responsive product teams really win the hearts of users. And finally, you can use both of these uh, approaches as underpinnings for something which is a little bit more domain specific. And that's a data binding framework that allows you to talk in the language of your product. In this case, you know being able to take a temperature value and apply it to a color gradient or to a color mapping without necessarily any intermediate programming because my domain specific language is lifting me out of that and just giving me the problem in the context of the product that I'm working with. Three different approaches, three different um, you know, sort of types of solutions, um, all equally valid, they'll all get you to the end result, but each with different pros and cons. So 
we're going to be doing our last session of the summer in our next uh, next run. Um, but I do uh, suggest that you subscribe to our channel. Um, that way, when we come back in September, I anticipate September timeframe, uh, you'll be able to get the notifications. And if you haven't watched our other sessions, I would really encourage you to take a look at those. Um, I'm just going to take a peek now and see if we've got any questions. Um, as always, I love to get questions, love to take the opportunity to talk to, uh, talk to you about the topics. If I don't get to your question today, um, bring it up next time. We can always jump into those topics. So one of the questions that has come through here is, is one type better than the other? Or is stronger keeping the UI and the data model cleanly separated? You know, we haven't talked about implementation, about what keeps the model and the UI data separated. Really, this separation doesn't have as much to do with the glue logic as it has to do with your overall product design, uh, the environment and the ecosystem that you're sitting inside of. And that's why I said, you know, we're going to talk about events and data being transformed. The glue logic itself um, doesn't have to necessarily play a role. Different languages, different techniques um, can give you different types of sharing, uh, both tightly coupled, but still providing you with an API abstraction to give you a clean separation, um, as well as totally decoupled. And because of the different types of environments that you run in, process-based, task-based, you're always going to have a question of what does that separation physically look like, right? Is my UI on top of my bundle all running inside of one process? It's not really desirable, but you can certainly keep it clean. Or is my UI a separate execution process from my system model, which is certainly the desirable approach to really keep them at arm's length. Um, you can do this with C, you can do this with scripting, you can do it with any of the you know, sort of approaches we've talked about in terms of keeping them separate or keeping them together. Really what you want to make sure you're not doing is moving the glue logic from the UI box here over into the system model box, right? You want to be able to make sure that those two uh, do remain separated, right? Because again, this is relatively stable. Your data model for your system doesn't change. If I'm a thermostat, I have set points, I have temperatures, I have different IO capacities. The data is really fixed what changes and what varies a lot is the UI. So you want to keep this component all together. You don't want to have to rebuild your system model every time you change your glue logic. Are there other side benefits from keeping the UI and system data separate from each other in UI development? Um, kind of touched on that a little bit, um, but definitely. Definitely uh, when we keep them separated, you have the opportunity to do things like hot restart, right? Where I might want to do an update to my UI, again, my system model, the data here is all sitting, um, executing, continuing to gather data and running on the system. I don't need to power the system down. I could do a soft restart of just the UI component. Now, of course, your architecture has to support that. Um, and certainly with Storyboard, we make that easy because we have an event-based approach um, where you could reinitialize and design in an event update that will go and populate your UI. If this was all combined together into one module, then you'd really be forced to do a full system, you know, kind of shut down, restart, which is a lot more interruption for your end user. Software restart can be measured in, you know, fractions of seconds, where your power cycling down and up is always going to be longer. Is there ever a case where using multiple glue logic types would be required or beneficial? That's a fantastic question. Um, and it is certainly something that we see. The intent of the glue logic is always to be as small and as light as possible. You really, you're not trying to do heavy computation in your glue logic. Your glue logic is here to facilitate the transfer of data from the system model into the presentation. And then from the presentation, usually because you're interacting with the user, back down to the system model. So this is really a domain switch, right? I'm moving from one domain to another. Um, if you had heavy computation, then you may want to have a C callback approach because you'd like to get that compiled optimization. Um, if you are looking for a lot of flexibility, um, you can mix and match between the you know, sort of high level abstract glue logic sitting on top of the compiled or the scripted glue logic. And in fact, that's 
definitely what happens um, quite often. Node-RED is a JavaScript framework. So it's sitting on top of a JavaScript base. Uh, so if you needed to drop down into that, you could do that. In our case, we have Lua, and it's very, very straightforward to build something on top of the Lua API that we provide for communication into the UI that does data binding based on events received or works with our DOM module and provides additional functionality on top of our DOM, which represents the UI, so that you can get this transparent type of behavior of I'm setting a value and the DOM element knows that if I'm setting a value of temperature, I need to format it through a string, I need to convert it to the current setting units, and that can all be managed transparently. So yes, absolutely, mixing and matching is something that can be done. Um, you probably don't want to go overboard and mix and match everything in all cases, because then you're gonna end up, yes, pulling the benefits from all three, but you're also going to pull the you know, sort of the detractors from all three. So if I have to have compiled code, that's going to slow me down, even though maybe the majority of my callbacks uh, the majority of my glue logic here are implemented in scripting logic. So you want to be very judicious when you're thinking about mixing and matching. Certainly um, going from scripting to the abstract language, definitely something that happens on a regular basis, however. Looks like that's all the questions for today. Um, thank you very much for attending today. Um, hope you enjoyed it. hope you learned a little bit of something about uh, you know, kind of how we connect in our systems outside of just the design patterns um, and some of the techniques and uh, technologies that you should consider when you're, you're binding in your glue logic for your system. Um, our next session, uh, we're going to talk a little bit about some of the UI challenges of doing uh, automated testing, driving the UI in an automated fashion. How do I test that scenario? Uh, what does it look like? It's a very large topic. We're going to talk, talk touch on it uh, sort of superficially as we go into the summer. And then we'll pop back out again in September. So if you don't want to miss anything, subscribe to the channel, get the notifications, and thank you very much for listening.